so welcome everyone to this conversation with Ben Roberts and welcome Ben thanks for joining us and um, yeah being game in this exploration of uh, what has what has brought you here to this time in in the world and in your life and so instead of me introducing you I think I would really like to allow you to choose what the highlights of your life you want to share with us that somehow connect you with the summit and, and, and that work that you did. Sure. Um, tell a little story. <laughs> I was, um, I was at an event uh, on Whidbey Island, which is in the Salish Sea, north, not too far from Seattle, at the Whidbey Institute called the Winter Gathering, happens every year. And um, we saw the premiere of a film uh, created by Vicki Robin, who some of you may know, called, called Your Money or Your Life. And I'm sitting in this room with about 60 people, including Vicki, watching this movie. And the experience of watching that movie connected up sort of the arc of my, my work in a way that, that had it make sense to me where it hadn't before. And, um, and I had the sense that, we, could there be anyone else in this room for whom this experience is happening right now? So the movie begins, uh, it, it's about, our, about money and our economy and, and um, what alternatives to that might be. So it starts on Wall Street, which is where my working career started after I graduated from college. Um, not because I had any special designs for that, but because I had studied Japanese and they were hiring people who spoke Japanese in 1985 on Wall Street because the Japanese were the biggest buyers of US treasury bonds and real estate and things like that. Um, so sort of accidentally, I wound up in the belly of the beast in the bond markets where money is created and, and where most investment money is moved around. Um, and uh, and the movie the movie starts there, sort of talking about that, and I realized you know I had had this kind of inside view to to that experience. Um, then it moves to to Main Street um, and what you know the the small business world is like, and that's where I went next. I I started a small business after I went back to to, to grad school to business school, and then thought I was was going to go into real estate, but I wound up doing becoming a small businessman, literally had a business on Main Street in Norwalk, Connecticut, about 40 miles south of where I am now, and, um, and ran that with a, with a partner, um, helped me develop it, and we raised money, and we ran it, and, and then um, that lasted until about 2002 when I turned it over to somebody else. I wish I could say I sold it for some huge amount of money, but it, it wasn't financially successful. It was in other ways. It, it was an indoor golf center, of all things, um, innovative and creative, you know, with my, uh, there's an entrepreneurial thread, maybe that runs through my work, but, but tied to this activity that's, that's pretty mainstream and there we are, we're on main street. So, um, and I left that in 2002 and I really wanted to do something that was more, um, in service to the times, which I thought were pretty dire at that point. And, uh, uh, but also offering possibilities for transformation. And, and so the movie, in the movie, you start seeing what are alternatives to, to this economy, this Wall Street and Main Street economy that, that you know, doesn't work very well for Main Street and is making a small number of people and in institutions very rich and has all these dysfunctional things built into it. And so you start seeing speakers who are talking about alternative economic paradigms and alternative currency paradigms and, and, and things of that sort. And, and these are the kinds of people, the, some of the exact people that I was seeing at conferences that I started to attend because what I wound up doing was getting involved back in the investment world as a socially responsible investment advisor, helping people invest their money according to their values. And um, so in the process of that, the, the firm I worked for also hosted this annual conference on, on that theme. And, and I started getting introduced to, to a whole variety of kind of mind blowing ideas and possibilities people like Hazel Henderson and uh, Hunter Lovins and um, met many of uh, Bernard Litter who helped create the Euro and another currency mm -hmm. called the, the Terra, other, other things along those lines. So um, I was doing that. I was sort of going along just fine with that, um, trying to grow my little practice and not sort of wondering, was it making enough of a difference? 
and then all of a sudden, um, I, I got exposed to the idea of, of facilitating groups. It was I, th I thought I would find clients by starting a local discussion salon in a coffee house here in Newtown. So I did that for like a year. We met every week. It was like an instant success. I had no training in, in facilitation, knew nothing about group process, but somehow just intuitively was creating something and holding space without even knowing that term and it was going well. And exactly, that was in 2009. And exactly a year into that, in, in February 2010, um, I start seeing some stuff happening in response to the Tea Party here in the US. And it was all, it was about a, a political movement of, of activate, you know, activism in response to that. And they wanted people to gather in local coffee houses and have civil dialogue about the issues of the day, which is exactly what I had been facilitating for the past year, every week with some success. And so I got very excited about this. And what was also exciting was how many people were interested in this, like 100,000 people a month for three months straight joined this Facebook group that was the main organizing thing. It was like one Facebook group post, like one invitation suddenly launched, you know, hundreds of thousands of people saying they're interested. And, and, you know, of that, lots of us were engaged in really intense conversations, you know, on Facebook, we would get on the phone too. And what could we do? What should this thing be? How do we respond? And, and so it was amazing to see all that. And as I came to the point of thinking, well, I, I want to get involved in this and I have something to offer, I thought, well, maybe I actually don't know much about what I've been doing and, and I should find out about it. And all of a sudden I learned about the whole world of group process facilitation mm -hmm. and um, that there were amazing processes like the World Cafe and open space technology and appreciative inquiry and future search that could work with very large groups and create amazing insights that were emergent from the, the, the collective wisdom and intelligence of that group. And I also learned at the same time as that, you know, I was here, I was seeing how Facebook was gathering people and the power, this new power we had to gather people in, in, and use this technology. And so I asked the question, um, you know, who's doing this stuff virtually? Who's taking these processes that were all developed in person and doing them virtually? And the answer I got from, from um, one of the people in, who was doing that most successfully, uh, Amy Lenzo from the World Cafe Community Foundation was about six. Um, this is all happening within like a week of, of all of my learning that this stuff is going on. I just like, you know, can't not pay attention to anything but this. I'm hardly even sleeping. I'm like, Amy, so how many other people are doing this? She said about six. I said, you mean like that you're working with directly in your group? No, 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 like six in the world. <laughs> and, and in that moment, it was like, well, can there be seven? You know, can I work with you? Would you show me this? Because because it just struck me from what I had learned in that short period of time and what I was observing on Facebook was that this was a way to really make, you know, help make a difference in this time of crisis and transition. Um, that, that we had this whole set of social technologies for working with groups and we had these new, you know, this new virtual tech space to apply them. Um, and, and that was this wide open, you know, exciting terrain. And if I could get in there and sort of take a crash course and how to be good at that, I could be of service in a way that felt much more relevant to me than, um, you know, then helping people, you know, own, you know, not own Exxon, but wind up owning Monsanto and McDonald's, you know, yeah. um, which is kind of how that game was working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so the reason that just going back to the movie, right in the movie after s the next part of the movie, after sort of this theoretical framework was the Occupy Wall Street uh, movement. And within that, that was within a year of my starting down this path, or actually it was about a year and a half. But by the time that hit, I had already learned how to do a lot of these things virtually and was sort of looking for the next thing. I had worked with the Pachamama Alliance for a while, that initial political thing in response to the Tea Party, I stayed with for maybe a year while I started exploring other things. It's still going on in some sense. It's called the Coffee Party Movement. Um, but, uh, but then Occupy came along and, and, and I really, that just seemed like the right place to land. It was over 13 months along with um, some people that I had met through the, the Pachamama Alliance work, we, we ran Occupy Cafe, which was an online space for kind of connecting the movement to the wider world. And we had calls three times a week and we had an online community, kind of like the Mighty Networks thing that, that's here now, but on a, a different platform called Ning, which I actually is still around and I kind of recommend as an alternative, by the way. Um, and we even landed it on the ground in person when the Occupy movement had a national gathering in the summer of 2012. And, and so after that, I, I've been kind of attaching myself at any given point in time 
to, to a number of different uh, initiatives and campaigns and alliances and networks um, and trying to integrate in-person as well as virtual gathering and convening. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's in, in the movie, it's like all those things sort of followed a path. And so when, the, when they got to the Occupy Wall Street stuff, now I'm looking at people I actually had been working with. Um, through Occupy Cafe. So I went from people I saw on the stage to people I'm, and, and I'm just watching this sort of spiral and saying, you know, the fact that I've done all these different things gives me a perspective on what it means to actually transform the world we're in to be, you know, a more socially just, environmentally sustainable, spiritually fulfilling place for all beings. It's the, the formulation the Pachamama Alliance used that, that immediately resonated for me and, and you know, th this whole notion that we're in a time of a between stories, as Charles Eisenstein says, that the new stories emerging. Charles Eisenstein was one of the people that I, that was a, a special guest with, in Occupy Cafe, for example. And he, he wrote a piece in the early days of uh, the Occupy movement called No Demand is Big Enough and got on our radar. And that was the beginning of a few different times when, when he and I collaborated. So, so this whole notion of a new story and a new paradigm was kind of the, the cornerstone for my work and the thought that if I became skilled at, at convening and holding space for collective wisdom to emerge among those people who, you know, are, are taking a stand for that to emerge and are working towards that, that would be a, a powerful contribution. Um, yeah, I could say more about kind of more recent years and how that's evolved and how coming down to earth fits in, but maybe I'll just stop there because that's where the movie stopped. <laughs> so my, my my question evidently is was the movie about you actually and with a different name and who was the actor yeah. <laughs> i mean it certainly felt like you know there couldn't be anyone else in the room that could track those things and those people in quite the way that i had mm. um, you know before that i had thought well i just would start something and then i would stop it and do something else you know instead of having a a successful career as an investment banker, I decided to become an entrepreneur. And then when that wasn't super successful and I, that had run its course, I decided to be an investment advisor. And then I decided to do this other stuff and, and nothing really connected to anything else or built on it, you know. Um, but I, I, and I'm, I'm still, I, I feel like the, the place that all that might be taking me to, the, the place where all those experiences and, and and knowledge and connections really come together and manifest something um, that 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 truly builds on all of that. I'm I'm not quite there yet. Mm. You know, maybe maybe close. Maybe I'll never get there. I don't know. But it feels still very much like a like a journey and a uh, and a challenge and a possibility space. And, you know. Um, some of my thinking has also evolved around, you know, are we going to make this transformation or not? Um, and what does it mean to do this work if, if collapse is more likely than the emergence of a new paradigm? Mm. Or some messy mix of all of that that isn't really the, the world that works for all that, that we used to talk about mm. uh, being you know, still being possible. Do you say, so for me, from what I've seen you doing during the summit and, and from what I've read about, about you, and now I have to watch the movie, of course. Um, I have the feeling that, so I would call you a dialogue designer almost, or a dialogue wizard, actually. Um, um, Process artist is a, is a term. Yeah, that, that's also, yeah, but, but I have the feeling that dialogue, conversation, this, this kind of, um, things that emerge from people talking to each other. It's kind of more or less a story arc on, on, on your life to some degree. Um, and now that I know that you started because of, because of a language actually, because you learn Japanese, it's kind of, oh, right. Mm. <laughs> so what do you think? So if, I, I think I share that, that doubt or that unsettlement about what what is coming is is it is there still hope for transformation or is there going to be either collapse or a very not necessarily violent but a very um challenging transformation and my question is how do you see the role of dialogue the, the role of communication right now 
to prepare us for something like that? Um, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right that that the dialogue was the the core sort of inspiration for the work that I moved into 10 years ago in 2010. In fact, one of the first things I did was to become a member of the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation, mm. which is a U.S. community practice. Um, and I'm still connected with many people I've met there, not so active. So I did see that as sort of this 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 key capacity, right? And particularly if I could learn how to create spaces for dialogue that use virtual tools, that would be a powerful offering. Where I've come to now is to recognize that's just one element. And if you look at the story of that movie, right? Money is, is, is the central theme. And so what I've really started to focus on more and more in the last few years, and, and even going back, I would say to 2000, um, late 2014, early 2015, with an initiative called the Thriving Resilient Communities Collaboratory that I've been co-stewarding, um, is, is how do we also work with money? Mm -hmm. That resources in general and the, and the notion of a gift economy, in particular as part of the vision of, of, of a transformed world, you know, flow and creating flows of resources to support transformational work is key. If, if and I hate using the, the frame just talk because I think that there's a mis, there's a devaluing of dialogue that happens through that that kind of language. But the truth is that if our conver, you know, there are powerful conversations that 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 result in resources moving, you know, and flowing. And and what do those look like? And what are the containers and the structures and the processes that are required? so that dialogue can can be in service to the to the movement of resources that's really where things have gone for me and i and i think that that when i look at that frame well moving resources towards you know whether it's a world that works for all or you know just creating spaces where you know we have some possibility within that container of, of thriving or surviving or healing or regenerating something, you know, though all of those require resources in different ways. And and so it's it's how dialogue can be of service to that, but it involves other elements that need to be um, created as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think dialogue without action is just yeah um, beautiful, but then we, we we would be stuck somehow. I wonder I wonder how you see conflict given that this is for the conflict transformation. So how do you see conflict as part of that, part of what builds, can we use conflict as a way of preparing ourselves for whatever is coming? It doesn't have to be something bad, but is it, is it, can we use it as a kind of a tool or, or, or as a positive phenomenon? I mean, to me, part of the, the core structure of, of the summit that was created by Nunu, I think, in the lead and others, I, I, I joined the team with, with him and Eva after that was already framed. I started working with them in January. Um, but that framing kind of names it beautifully, right? That, that there's a paradigm shift that's available to us in how we think about and work with conflict. And so in the old, the old paradigm that's, that's causing this collapse um, you know, has certain dysfunctional patterns relating to conflict and there are new new ways of, of working with conflict that support that new paradigm that are essential to it. Um, and I think in the you know in the summit we we saw that reflected at these different levels, right? There's the inner level of, of you know, internal conflict. There's within groups and teams that I think was maybe the core uh, the spark for the summit, you know, coming into being was that there were, you know, groups within the transition towns movement that were having a lot of conflict or conflict between groups. And within that movement, here are people that are in theory all aligned towards a vision, you know, of, of transition, but somehow they're fighting with each other. And that's, you know, seriously affecting their ability to, to, to be effective as change makers. And, and how do they address that? How do we address that? That's a pattern that, that I've seen, you know, in many, many groups. Um, and so, so there's that level. And then there's the level of how, you know, there's a conflict within, embodied in this whole notion of a paradigm shift, that, that the dominant paradigm and systems of, of extraction and oppression and, and 
control and power over, you know, our um, I have not wanting to let resilience, go resilience, right? That there, <laughs> and and in order to create change, there's at least you know, there's a there's a struggle, there's a battle, there's a fight, there's a conflict between the poss new possibilities and these. And even that notion has, you know, is, is troubling for many people, right? That 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 uh, that us versus them thinking is is part of you know, what what got us here. That always, you know, being in this mode of of conflict. Um, so so anyway, it's it's relevant across all those levels, and 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 all of those things have showed up in in my work in different ways. Um, right, and then so this new paradigm. So it. I think I, I I understand that that not a problem, but the the conflict I have myself with with that idea of a new paradigm sometimes is that that tension that you just described of the old versus the new, and then again perpetuating that idea of separation. Um, so I wonder how um, is there a way of which is, I have the feeling that's part of what you're doing. You are using the tools that are still really good from, from the systems that are in place in order to perhaps from the inside or using those tools to create new possibilities or invite new possibilities for different types of living together. Maybe it's not a paradigm per se, but it's, it's you know, there's a shift. How do we prevent the I don't want to use the term bad, but like, you know, how do we prevent the, the patterns and the traumas that are part of that old paradigm to percolate when we are using those tools, like say the finan financial ways that, that we can use, the, the, even the gift economy has so much from, from, from what we're trying to go away from. So is it, do you have a sense of, are the mechanisms for, from, of, for preventing that in some way? Yeah. Um, I think it's in some ways it's inevitable that the that the patterns of the of the dominant paradigm will show up in spaces that are, you know, where people are attempting to bring forth a new way of being together and mm -hmm. of, of organizing ourselves in the world and of being in relation to the to the world. Um, so it's a, in some ways, it's it's understanding that and and what I think was so rich in the summit was the you know the array of different practices for for dealing with that when that happens, um, and dealing with it in in a way that itself embodies the transformation. So I, I think that's what's what's all you know potentially available to us all the time is that in any given moment we can choose to engage in that moment from a place that embodies a transformed. You know, presence versus one that embodies the the, the dominant culture that we're looking to, to transcend. I think the other thing I'm hearing you name as a challenge, though, is that by framing it as you know the dominant culture, this mainstream thing that's wrong and evil and bad and, and causing climate change and and you know economic inequality and is structurally embedded in a racist genocidal paradigm, et cetera, et cetera. That that when you create this enemy. You know, and and then you're in a battle against it. That that itself is an old paradigm dynamic, and so I think there's a real paradox in how to transcend that. Um, I think that some of the, that the the best answers I've heard, you know, come out of some of the the things that I've seen indigenous people practicing in their in their resistance movements, like Standing Rock. I mean, this amazing story of how the the protesters there led by indigenous people from the area but but, but many others of, of all stripes um you know treated the, the the army that was basically brought in to to attack and dismantle them uh, as you know as as friends not mm -hmm. as enemies you know as as equally oppressed by this this system um and offered them care literally you know when the same time that they were being sprayed with fire hoses, you know, doused with water in sub-zero temperatures, I mean, deadly force being used against them. They're offering care packages, you know, here's some 
blankets and, and you know, hand warmers and stuff for you because we know you're cold too. Um, that kind of an approach that says, yeah, we're, we're here to take a stand in opposition to something. There's some stuff that needs to stop. There are some new ways we need to be, and we will fight for that. We, we proudly fight for that. And at the same time, we, we do it from a place of love, from a place of caring, from a place where we don't other any human being, you know, any other human being. You know, that goes back to Gandhi and King and stuff mm -hmm. too, but I've seen it there. And there's a wonderful song called For Her Speak by um, my muse with Lila June, Navajo woman, that has some lyrics that, that just name this too about how we're in this battle and, and Mother Earth is calling forth her best warriors, but but we're not fighting each other. We're fighting against fear and hate mm -hmm. um, and for love. Um, uh, so. mm. Mm, that's beautiful. Um, I would love to just, yeah, um, let that just sink sink in. Um, yeah, so I, I, I can imagine that coming from that place of compassion and, and, and speaking from the heart that you're mentioning, so I, I, I can see the, the beauty and the value of that. And I, I personally, I just feel that the culture I have grown up in and I, the cultures I live in, um, we are lacking that, that being taught how to become that person from an early age. So we, I, I have learned some tools to do that in, in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm, I understand that the inner transformation is, is it has a, an enormous value and it's, it's what we need to do. What worries me is how, is how do we have the time for everybody to go through that? And if not, how do we make those, how do we invite the inner transformation into the places where we are making decisions, the places of politics, the places of Wall Street? How do we invite people to start meditating? How do we invite people to recognize all those things that are so important and so beautiful? And I know um, it's a big question, but... <laughs> no, it's a beautiful question. And, and I love that you're using the word invite because the way I normally hear that said is how do we get oh. those people to do X, Y, and Z or to stop doing A, B, and C, right? Which is framed in, a, in you know, that's the paradigm of control or it's more subtle version of manipulation or selling or persuasion um, as opposed to invitation, right? And, and one of the... One of the things that's inspired me the most is, is this this book, this little book by Peter Block called the Community, mm -hmm. The Structure of Belonging. And, and in it, he there's a lot of wonderful theoretical stuff. But it's all framed around the idea that we need to move from a culture of retribution to one of restoration. Um, and that he identifies six conversations that are essential for a community to do that. And he's focused very much on community, on that scale. Um, and the first one is invitation. Mm -hmm. And he has beautiful distinctions around what that really means. And that it's not an invitation if, you, if I'm trying to sell you on it, if I'm trying to convince you, if I'm trying to you know, entice you. It has, on the contrary, I have to tell you, it's totally fine for you to say no, mm -hmm. for any reason or none. It's okay. It will be okay with me. I'll still invite you to the next thing. I'll still invite you to this thing. And also there's actually a price if you say yes. I'm not just asking you to do this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask something more of you than just saying yeah. Your yes means something. There's a commitment of some kind involved in that yes. And, and this commitment is also one of the other conversations. The invitation conversation sort of embodies all, all six of them in a way. Um, so they also include commitment. They include possibility, dissent ownership and gifts. And um, so I think that's it, that it, it has to come from that place, right? Um, that we have to really be consciously choosing to show up for this work and to show up and be willing to pay a price for it. Mm. Um, and what that price is, you know, that's, that's a really interesting question. Mm. Uh, but I, I think that that's part of it. Uh, the other thing I think is, is um, I, 
I, I kind of, I, I don't know, I feel, I think we have to start from a place of being brokenhearted. This is something I'm just kind of beginning to understand. Um, that, that we're in denial about the state of things, if that's not true. And, you know, there's something about the the versions of this story of a world that works for all that I got attached to that I kind of sensed as a sort of sh a short circuiting of that. Like, if this is true, and if we can all work really, really hard in this little window of time we have to make this wonderful world that we know we can do, and we have all the solutions, and we have the capacity, then I don't have to be brokenhearted. Mm. And I think, you know, we have to be brokenhearted for what's already taken place, even if that's true, let alone, you know, the possibility that we're not going to make it to that promised land or that a lot of us won't. Hmm. Um, and it seems more and more to me that every day there's a new reason for our hearts to break. And, you know, it's very hard for me to stay present to that. Hmm. Um, and I'm sure it is for many people. Um, but I kind of think that's at least the, there has to be, there isn't a, a willingness to, to be in that space and an intention to be open to that. I think we get trapped by this sense of urgency and, you know, all these people who aren't doing the right thing and all the ways that I'm not doing the right thing by choosing to live the life I'm choosing to live, you know, which personally is one of, of pretty substantial privilege. And, you know, we don't have enough earths for everybody to live like I do, that's mm -hmm. for sure. Um, and there's some things I'm, you know, I would give up if I could more easily. There's other things I, you know, I'm choosing not to for now, um, maybe for selfish reasons. So there's heartbreak in that, mm. um, as well as in just looking at how, you know, people in power are behaving right now, and what they are and aren't doing, and what can we really do to address that. Thank you. That's so that you just speak my heart so beautifully. Um, I think personally that that we we're just so afraid of grief and, and of broken heartedness because we, we again the, the most of the societies that are in, in power of, of the world, we, we've lost those social technologies to address that pain and to to make it I think the problem is not the pain, but the resistance we have to it. So it's a suffering is going to be there. It doesn't matter how perfect the world is. There's always going oh, to be loss. Yeah. Yeah. But we have this resistance, right? And and um, I think what you said is that I, I had the realization recently that if I if I truly realize how much I love, say, my mother or 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 the earth, actually then there's so many things that I, ca I cannot do because they break my heart. Because I, I, I'm just, I cannot eat this because I, I'm, I'm, I can't. It's just that realization, that pain is, is, is necessary. But I, I'm really scared of calling, inviting that in because of, yeah, it might have just really yeah. strong consequences. There's a passage in Naomi Klein's book, um, This Changes Everything. Hmm. Is that what it's called? I'm spacing out now. I'm trying to find it. Uh, okay. I'll have to paraphrase it. Why is it funny that it's not showing up? I'd love you to paraphrase it, actually. So she's talking, she talks about, you know, why is it that people aren't taking more action? Hmm. You know, if we do have the answers, if we do have so many of the solutions and, you know, the, the new paradigm approaches to how, you know, food, water, energy, community, organizations, money, you know, all the things, government, all the things that need to change, you know, even our own relationships and our sense of ourselves, if, if all of this is available to us, how come we're not using it more and, and the, that the standard story is we're too selfish and greedy, we don't care. That's the old paradigm version. And that's the old paradigm story of who we are, right? We're these selfish, you know, utilitarian kind of machine-like creatures that, that are just trying to take care of ourselves and maybe our immediate circles. But, you know, it's, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. And, and mm. More for you means less for me. 
So she says, no, what if that's not it? What if it's not that we don't care, but that we're overwhelmed by how much we do and that we lack the collective spaces to process that, to, to, to deal with the grief that we feel, you know, that the sheer terror of ecocide, that's mm. the, the phrase she used. And that particularly this idea of collective spaces really struck me in that, you know, that, and I've seen this in, you know, in some of the practices around grief that I've done a little bit of investigating into, because that's been a theme too, part of my sort of recognizing what's needed in these collective spaces. Yeah, we got to make room for that. Um, you know, Joanna Macy, of course, does beautiful work for that, others too. Um, so uh, I just lost the, the thread of it. But that that's missing. Oh, the grief has to be collectively processed. That's one of these insights. So, so traditional cultures knew how to do that, of course, right? That was part of the fabric of daily life is that you had these rituals and these practices. And we've lost that, most of us on this planet. And so we can't do it well unless we create those spaces mm. um, and relearn some of those, those practices. Yeah. Absolutely. And it goes back, I think, again, to Block talking about community is that, you know, that part of his insight was that we, there are things we, we have to work collectively. That's part of the new paradigm is that we're all in this together. We're not individuals, we're not separate. And, and so, you know, there's only so far we can get if we operate as independently rather than interdependently. Yeah, I think also that a lot of the, the, the work that we do alone, which is also important, I think grief has a, a, a a solitude component that is is necessary but if we only do it alone then i have the feeling that we just get re-traumatized because we, we we lack that compassion and that validation that comes from the tribe that we don't have anymore yeah i would love to see more grief collective grief spaces appearing and the problem i have there is that a lot of the as we have lost that technology a lot of the things that we need to do feel very clunky and in, in some cases it feels like we are appropriating um, things from other cultures as well so there is a conflict there as well in how to again the conflicts come from the how do we solve the problem more than mm. perhaps the the direction we want to go yeah yeah i was in a on a call a few years back um where we were asked to imagine this world that works for all mm. and it struck me no it wasn't a call maybe we were in, i don't remember i remember who was facilitating it manuel manga from the institute for evolutionary leadership check them out um but it struck me as we were having this conversation that that in you know there was lots of clarity about what it wasn't mm. you know we were really clear on what we were opposed to and what this world wouldn't look like. And some of the principles maybe of what it would embody, a lot of that was, was well articulated too in this different kinds of new story framings. Um, but what the sort of daily lived experience of it would be, like I'd never really kind of thought about it much. And, and, and so I had this wonderful vision of rewilding of, of, of humanity um, and this sort of, um, this reemergence of, of the idea of, of tribal identity, you know, and, and clans and some of those things, but, but that they were, they were new forms, right? That they borrowed. It wasn't, it, it, we weren't going back. We were recreating, we were just creating whole new ways and, you know, but, but, it, and they all were working in harmony together much more that that was part of what we learned to do, or we managed conflict in generative ways rather than, you know, destructive ones. So we weren't having wars, but, Anyway, that I was just, I love this idea, you know, that we just sort of fragmented, you know, instead of this global corporate monoculture that we're oh. oppressed by now, right? That there was this massive, uh, somebody else has used the frame, a, a Cambrian explosion. I guess that was a period in Earth's history where there was this huge, you know, growth in the number of different species um, on the planet, that we had that culturally. And it led to sort of this, this birth of all these new groups. And, and I've, I've been inspired by that vision mm -hmm. in this sense that, you know, in my work, I might be able to, to be um, 
in, in a co-leadership role in the emergence of something like a, a community like that, or or even an invitation for lots lots of those communities to form in different ways, um, and you know to, to propagate and give birth to other communities and things like that 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 used a lot of our virtual capacities, but also had an in-person element that was that, that anchored them to a place or to a set of places. So that's been another interesting challenge and possibility. Mm, that sounds beautiful. Wow. Again, you speak my heart. Um, um, I'm wondering, I would love to go back a bit to the summit, um, although it's very tempting to just go into your visions of the future. But I've, I was wondering, um, I loved at the beginning of the summit that the, it was kind of very clear that there, was, there wasn't a, a goal. So there wasn't a, a kind of a product or, or, or something that was expected from, from the summit, but it was just whatever, whatever is emerging. So I'm, I'm wondering now that the summit is more or less over, um, what has it brought to you? Has it brought something? Is it, what, what has been your harvest? Mm -hmm. Is there a harvest? It doesn't have to be. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was so rich and multidimensional that, that you know, it, it reminds me of something in in, the, in another gathering of doing a series of gatherings called Now What, um, starting you know, beginning in March of, of last year, 2019. And um, it was a, I had a lot of focus on meaning making and this harvest at the end of it. We were going to make collective meaning. That part of the, the theory was, you know, we're having trouble collectively making sense of the world. And if, and if, if mm. we got really good at doing that, that would be a powerful offering. And so everything was sort of designed with these invitations to, to do that. And it didn't work very well. It worked in a certain form with a certain, you know, if, if, the, if the question was really tightly focused and we limited ourselves to that, then there was, you know, I felt like we got somewhere with that in one iteration, but I sort of let go of it. And at a certain point I realized well, we're just making meaning everywhere. You know, it's, it's not that meaning is scarce. Um, and, and, and I think that, you know, I kind of have that with the harvest here too, that, that there's, there's almost something, I, I don't know. I just, so I think there's, there's so much, right. Um, that, that happened and that, that I learned and that clearly other people learned and, and I don't expect that we'll ever sort of capture all and package it and be able to say, here's what it was. I can certainly point to some things for me. Um, and I also think that, that these, well, so, so one of the things that became really clear and, and you were a huge part of this and so was Shanti, um, was that, that there was this yearning for community and connection and that the whole, in, to some degree, as, as beautiful and powerful as the whole journey framing was and this invitation to, to, to you know, to explore the idea of conflict transformation together, that it, that it could have been any number of other things, you know. And what was really so energizing was was this sense of community and connection, and people discovering, you know, others who they identified and connected with and, and felt safe with a level of safety that that seemed to be present from a very you know right away uh, was quite powerful and astonishing. Um, and maybe there's some more harvesting to be done and. and as far as thinking, well, what, what led to that exactly? Um, I mean, I think a lot of the care that Nuno and Eva put into the, the initial framings and the website and, you know, it all had a lot to do with that. Um, and, and, but I'm, I'm also open to, to, to thinking about that more. Anyway, so there was that piece. It was a real validation of, of that need uh, and, and the primacy of, of that, that if we, if we create places where there is a sense of community and of belonging and of, of connection with the weaving social fabric. Um, that's, that's, that justified, you know, that's, that's, that's meeting an, a really strong need. And that need was just so there so that when we created the space where that could happen, you know, you all just rushed in and went, yay. <laughs> and we didn't have to do a lot in the sense, you know, beyond that. Um, another thing, that was, you know, at, at the process level, there were lots of interesting, you know, chances to um, 
to experiment and you know try different things out or see how different combinations of things that I've worked with in the past, you know, worked in this context. And um, one of the most striking things to me was how much energy and activity showed up in the online community space. Mm. The decision to even have that was made at the very last minute. Um, and without a whole lot of, you know, debate or consideration, you know, I had put a bunch of options on the table for what kinds of virtual engagement invitations we might launch and, you know, put out. And that was on the list. And I think Muna was thinking about stuff like this anyway. And he just decided, you know, like the weekend before, yeah, we're going to do Mighty Networks. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, fine. <laughs> and I wasn't a huge fan of Mighty Networks from experiences in the past, but in general, I mean, like I mentioned, um, am I, am I cutting out here? Are we still good? I'll just keep talking. So, so I've had multiple experiences using those kinds of online community spaces and the pattern so much of the time is that you put a lot of effort into it and a lot of people join and then just not much happens there. Um, mm. and I've seen that in particular with Mighty Networks through several iterations of other instances. Um, you know, went back with Occupy Cafe when we are using the Ning platform, we had pretty good participation there. But even then, you know, we're also doing three large, you know, interactive calls a week or more. Um, and you had sort of one group that was on those calls and another group that was online. And there wasn't nearly as much cross pollination between them as I thought would happen. But this time in this event, this is maybe the first time I've seen this degree of, you know, um, of all the different elements kind of synergizing together. So we had, we had the live calls, there were 99 of them by the end, I counted up that had taken place. We had all this stuff happening on the, on the Mighty Networks platform. We had the recorded material that people were watching and, and all of that oh, was kind of weaving together and, and creating this, this field of engagement and lots of people were in all three of those spaces. And that was really exciting and impressive and inspiring to see, you know, because I guess I'd gotten to the point where I was starting to be skeptical of whether that could work. To me, it always seemed like it made sense. And I would add, you know, we also want in-person in the mix. And we didn't do that this time, you know, maybe just because of COVID, part of the vision was that there would be all these little groups, right? And, and hundreds of people signed up to host groups, but that part maybe didn't quite, you know, it didn't, certainly didn't come together the way we, we hoped it would, but I think some mm. of it happened. Anyway, this really reinforced my sense of, of yes, this, this is powerful and possible and keep on going with the idea of bringing in all these different elements and, and having them, you know, uh, collectively create this field of engagement for people that's much more powerful than just doing any one of them separately. Mm. Yeah, I think that speaks for diversity again, um, like what you were saying about the future, having all these different things happening at the same time. I think it, it, it was overwhelming at times and I know some people found it like, oh, this is like, I don't know where to start. But somehow, like you say, everything was feeding on, on, on everything else and, and it just worked beautifully. And, and yeah, maybe this is topic for a separate conversation, but I am really interested in the safety. It's just, um, so I, I was wondering, you have a lot of experience with summits and stuff. And from what you just said, I have the, the feeling that this was somehow special in, in, in how quickly the safety was there for people. And it's something I'm really interested personal, personally as well. So do you have a feeling for what what could have brought that? Is it is it something in the structure that you laid, or I've I've been hearing as well recently that there is a certain readiness in the world at the moment in our yeah. society for these type of things to happen, so that we are kind of more ready. <laughs> <laughs> back to you Bro. right well i think you're right that there is there is a readiness there's a yearning i think it's connected to that desire for community and connection and social fabric and belonging um and maybe it's also connected to the broken heartedness piece that that's mm. putting people into a place where as soon as that gets you know, presence and, and name, people become more open, maybe softer. 
I think also, you know, again, I would say even, you know, something as, as technical as the website and the way that was created and um, the opening ceremony and how that was, how that space was held. Um, I think that mattered a lot. I think the fact that there was a week before the content for us to just get grounded a bit, I think that was really an important element to this. Um. Yeah, I, um, hopefully Dita can join us again, but um, yeah, I, I thought those were really great observations, Ben, and um, I'm wondering, have you had, and I know that you, you feel that there's something special about this summit, have you been able to have um, longevity in the communities that have come out of any of um, the other summits that you've um, become a part of, you know, that's, I feel like that's a really big question for me that like, there's a lot of momentum now. And how can you build on that momentum to ensure that, like a year from now and two years from now, we're still, um, we're still engaged with each other as a, as a community and still kind of, because um, there's, a, you know, I, I think the summit was kind of supposed to be a launching pad of sorts, kind of for the transitions moment was my understanding. And um, or at least a resource for them. Yeah. I think there was a, a hope that some things would get launched that would be valuable as well yeah. as it would be a learning experience. Um, I mean, a lot of my work has, uh, you know, Occupy Cafe ran for 13 months, so it wasn't really a summit. It was an ongoing space of engagement. The, the Thriving Resilient Communities Collaboratory is an ongoing initiative, you know, a community um, of 30 plus organizational leaders plus a larger network of people and, and you know, regular kinds of activities that we do. So a lot of my work has been, you know, isn't, isn't just in that framework. The, the Now What gathering is an interesting case because that, ha you know, the design of that was to have it happen uh, twice a year with this regular rhythm. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're coming up now in September on the 5th iteration, I guess, of now what, fourth or fifth, depending on how you count it. Um, and a lot of the same people are showing up. And some of the people you've met in Coming Down to Earth came because we were together in now what. And, and so the vision there was was to sort of have a both and, that there's, there's a community of people that forms that's showing up regularly and we're staying connected in between and we're, you know, things are spinning off and we're doing work together in lots of different ways. There's also this, this gathering that happens that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And that there's value in that too, uh, and there's value in iterating that rather than having it be ongoing. So you know, we you know, so we know we're going to do it again, and that makes it valuable also. But the next time doesn't have to you know we have time in between, so we can think about well what was that one like, and how do we want the next one to be different, and who's even the we that's involved, right? Um, so those are all different patterns. I, I I think the other thing I'll just say is that you know we're all embedded in these sort of networks of networks right now, and so. Mm -hmm just because the summit ends doesn't mean, you know, that these connections have to end at all. And, you know, you're taking leadership to, to see that that is the case. And, and it, you know, it's, so I'm very interested in, in um, sort of on the one hand, sort of just trusting that we're part of some larger set of, you know, this field of connection, this, this, something that's like the mycelial mat in the forest floor that, that, that's invisible, you know, and, and super fine grained and multidimensional and complex. And it's, it's connecting all this stuff up. Um, and sometimes mushrooms pop up, you know, the summits in a way are kind of like mushrooms that pop out from this mycelial mat. And mushrooms aren't meant to last very long and they can blow your mind and they can nourish you and they can kill you. <laughs> they're powerful in lots of ways. Um, but they're also just the thing that casts spores so that the, 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 the real body of the fungi, you know, the mycelium can, can continue and spread. And, and so it's like we put so much energy into building things, organizations and initiatives and alliances that are supposed to last a long time. And there's so much work involved in launching all of those. And, and, and we got lots of them, you know, lots of people think the problem is we have too many even and they, we need fewer and more of our energy concentrated in certain directions. So at least we need more collaboration, coordination among them. Do we need more of them? Um, I mean, maybe we do. I'm not, I'm not opposed to more, but what I feel is that filling the space between and among, you know, 
is a really valuable service. And to me, that part of that means that things don't have to be permanent, that whatever we trust, that whatever connections and energy we bring forth in something like this, you know, goes out into the world and continues and is of service. And I mean, I'm still connected with people from the, you know, from, from my coffee party days and from my Pachamama Alliance days and from Occupy Cafe. Suzanne Jones, who you've met here, was, was somebody who was very active in Occupy Cafe, for example. Um, so, uh, so to me, it's, you know, if we're going to have a chance of, of even having sort of pockets where, you know, islands of sanity is Meg Wheatley's term in the, mid, in the midst of, you know, a sea of collapse or bioregional, you know, organizing structures that allow for some degree of thriving and surviving and what's, what's coming. If that's going to happen, it would only be because this, this, this mad of connection already exists and is, is really alive and vibrant and much more powerful than maybe we were able to tell in this moment. Um, that's, that's part of my story. Yeah, I, uh, I can resonate with that. I, I, I'm, I'm very interested in this idea of cross pollination and the spaces between and among, um, and and I've, I've been sort of experiencing that as well. I've, you know, there's several communities that are all like, it's like a Venn diagram. Like there's parts of it that seem to like overlap into other circles, but there's all these different circles that have little areas of overlap in different places and. So then they're almost like portals where people are able to kind of go from one circle into another as a result of that and get connected to different yeah. groups. Yeah. yeah Dita, are you with us? I, I think another, you know, another thing is resources, right? Is that, that if you want something to last, it needs resourcing. Um, well, and even these spaces of connection between if they're, you know, if they're not moving resources around, then that really limits their, their power and their, um, mm their attractiveness and their relevance. Um, so I think that's another key element. There was something else I wanted to say, going back to the technology piece, and we're sort of, you know, the, the irony of Dita naming that and then blinking out and now she's popping back on Dan and on. You know, and it connects to this notion that people were overwhelmed by all the different technology in the summit. Um, and you know so i'm inspired to see all these different things happening and to see the synergies there and i and i know that that doesn't work for lots of people you know mm -hmm. um, yeah. and for that matter there's lots of people who can't get on a zoom call because they mm -hmm. don't have the device or a good enough internet connection and, and um or many other reasons so I'm really interested in what I've seen as a pattern so much is, is, is a reluctance to try a lot of stuff that might leave people behind, right? That there's a, because we want to be inclusive and that's so important that we not shut people out. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the default approach has been to sort of go with least common denominator offerings. You know, mm -hmm. what do we do that that's, that's, you know, that's really inclusive. And, and, and anytime we think about adding something else, being really conservative about that, because it might mm -hmm. mean that, that other people aren't going to be able, not everybody's going to going to be able to do that for one reason or another. And, and I, I get that. And I think that has its place for certain kinds of connecting and, and community building and work. But I also think we pay a huge price. And that, that if we can figure out how to not be limited by that and to say, you know what, we're going to create a whole array of opportunities for engagement. And we know that these are not going to work for everybody. And we also know there are people who are going to be challenged even by the, the, the bottom line. And we want to be, we want to be proactive in, in finding ways to, to fully include them. Right. And that might be a lot of work, but that's, you know, that's important. And that, that, if we do that, then is it okay then to have things that we know they can't participate in because they're still powerful and they create a larger field that, mm -hmm. that's more powerful and effective and serves everybody, including those who can't, you know, show up in those ways. So I feel like that's really important. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, it was one of the things I valued about, about coming out of Earth is that we were, you know, 
we were able to, to push some of those limits and play with tools like CoDigital, for example, and not only use it, but use it in one case for something it really wasn't even designed for. And yeah, mm -hmm. some people said, oh, that's kind of yucky. Why am I ranking, you know, outcomes that shouldn't be? Um, and, you know, but we, we did it anyway and, and, and learned something. And, and I think mm -hmm. there, was, there was value there. So, I mean, there's so much that's available to us, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. many different tools and platforms and processes, mm -hmm. right? And we, yeah, and, and they all require groups of people that want to use them together for something mm -hmm. real. Otherwise, you know, it's not even worth learning, learning how to use them. Um, so it's just, I, I've been frustrated in the past with, with the limits to our, our ability to make use of the, of the capacities we have. And I feel like we're just mm -hmm. babies still, even with this summit, which, you know, was pretty advanced in what it did and blew people's minds. We're still fairly scratching the surface. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Um, I think that, and, and the technology's out there too. That's, that's the thing. Like, you know, the, the, when you think about how artificial intelligence is being used in all different sorts of industries, like we, we are going to get to a place where, where um, the, the capabilities of the, of, of the communication tools we use is gonna, it's, it's, it's gonna continue to change how we are able to interact. Um, I thought it was interesting what you said about just having a multitude and variety of experience. And in a sense, that's how the diversity of our natural ecosystem works as well, isn't it? Um, and this idea of like, that I kind of pull from improv a lot of like, yes, and instead of no, but. And um, maybe maybe it is a yucky experience, but maybe maybe experiencing the yuckiness has some value in it. Maybe, maybe it's worth just saying yes to it and ex experiencing the yuckiness and, and having that, process of discernment even going through that process of discernment like what, what what about it was yucky and what about it is not yucky and maybe you know what where's the nuance in that what are the subtleties instead of asking questions and jumping into it maybe rather than making judgments before trying it in the first place and what i think is interesting is also about something like this is in some ways it, it made it um accessible to people who otherwise it would not have been accessible to and then the in-person ones in some ways would have been less accessible to other people so i think both of them have their pros and cons in terms of accessibility um so yeah I think these are very interesting points that i think think that that you made I, there, I have a friend in barbados for example who said that like i now have access to all these things during the pandemic um that someone from me um, in my community would never have access to because it's just not available here. And, and we just, we're not from an uh, income, um, uh, you know, pool that can access these things otherwise. And, and so, yeah, it, it, it's interesting. There's always going to be, no, nothing's ever going to be perfect, but what if there are enough options out there that there's something available for everyone. I don't know. It's interesting. And, and I think, you know, an, another, the, the tools may not be perfect, but when we add our own intentions and how we use those tools and how we, you know, the context we set for them, that can also create a huge shift in the experience. So even something like Dita popping in and out of the Zoom call, you know, we can, I think there are ways to reframe that and say, yeah, the, the tech isn't working the way we want, but there's there's something else. She's still here. I don't know. Yeah, you know, she yeah. can listen to the recording. It's it's making an interesting point for us as we're talking yeah. about it. You know, or you know, a, a platform like Mighty Networks is, is designed to, with certain assumptions about how people are going to engage, mm -hmm. and it kind of puts you into a certain box if you yeah. use it just the way it's designed. But we can hack it if we say we really want to do this and how do we use mighty networks to do that and oh okay we can have you know 10 groups and those groups are all actually part of one larger thing that we're doing i think shulamith was kind of suggesting something like that before that's not what how the groups are designed we're gonna it's, it's you know it's gonna require a little extra effort but not much necessarily for a group of us to agree mm -hmm. well we're gonna use the tool in this way right and then the tool suddenly is much more powerful than it would have been if we limit ourselves to the way it, you know it's, it's organizing us to to show up yeah um, so it's, it's more about it's not about the tool 
organizing us. It's about us organizing the tool. At the end of the day, we are the wielders of the tool and this idea, yeah, this idea of intention and how can we hack? How can we hack it to serve our needs? Um, yeah, that's really, really interesting. And, and there are a lot of assumptions built into, you know, how the tools are designed and also the processes we use um, that I think are worth questioning. You know, one of the biggest ones to me that I see all the time is, is that so much of our process design comes out of the world of in-person gathering. I mean, that's where, you know, that's what we're used to. And so just something as basic as well, if, if a large group of us wants to talk about something, we have to all get on a call at the same time together. Mm -hmm. That's the way we do it. Well, <laughs> you've seen how hard that is, right? It is hard with three people, try yeah. doing it with 35, it's kind of impossible, right? Um, and you wind up with an hour long call when you really want a three hour call, right? Um, so do we, I think there are ways that we can have spoken engagement that aren't limited by time zones and busy schedules and the languages that people want to speak and, and other factors like the specific context I want to show up in, right? Rosa showed up on the call earlier today because she's got a very particular thing she wants to organize that fits into the larger pattern of things. You know, she might have been, you know, so, so that's a that's a that's a common phenomenon that i want to be part of this large group i want to be part of this dialogue that's helping this group to move forward but i have a very particular thing i want to talk mm -hmm. about and if i have to fit into this kind of one size fits all one time fits all one tool fits all framework i i you know that really you pay a price and that mentality comes from the idea that we all had to show up in one building Mm -hmm. on one day for a certain set of hours or maybe it was three days but it certainly wasn't going to be a month because we have to go home we have lives mm -hmm. Right, um, but in the virtual world, that's not true. <laughs> so you know, the summit was four and a half weeks. That's that's really different from a two-day conference, right? Awesome. And I think that you know we can reinvent and reimagine a lot of what we do that makes use of of, of time and space in ways that virtual engagement supports. And 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 we're not, you know again we're, we're in the infancy of designing for that too so so we're still defaulting to you know can we get everybody onto one call at one time or we all have to be on one text-based platform and, and organize there and um you know or we can only do it in text form if we can't all show up and, and talk or mm -hmm. just a lot of different assumptions like that that i think we're going to learn we were unnecessarily limited by yeah and what if you can have all three how what, right. how would that change the dynamic? How 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 when maybe there's one person who can access one of three, and another person that can can access two, and another who can access all three, and and how somebody can only do it in person, and they're part of it. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah. I, that's yeah, I think totally, totally, totally possible. It's not even hard. I don't think. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we scratched the surface a little bit of, of a way to try to do it with the the summit wide dialogue in the in the fourth week. It didn't quite get there. Like we 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 had some nice engagement around framing questions, and there were a couple of conversations that got launched around it, but it, it didn't quite click for mm -hmm. you know, some interesting reasons. Um, but that was a one of my many attempts to to play with that form a little bit. Over, over. Yeah, it's all it's kind of trial and error and um, experimentation really, and then you just see okay next time how can we. How can, what small tweak can we make and what would that do? Um, and, and so much of it is like right time, right place, that sort of thing. Yeah, the context it's hard to know so much. Yeah. I mean, you invited a similar version of that today, Shanti, when you said, well, what if we all continued to meet as the little groups of three? Mm -hmm. Continue this conversation. Three people can schedule some time much more easily than 35. And, and that's exactly, you know, the pattern that we, we need to do more and more. And it says, you know, how do we how do we create inclusive spaces, you know, but not say that the only things we can do are things that everybody can do? Right, and like you know, you had at toward the end of that meeting, I think we had like four people that said, "Look, I just I just want to show up in like an open container and just connect," and so that that option exists too, and it it's it's a, it's a self organizing decentralized phenomenon. So if somebody wants to do that. 
they just create it. That's it. There, there isn't, there's nobody you have to ask permission from. You just go ahead and you create it. And then that's, that's an option. And then there's, it's, it's interesting, Nuno, and we had a conversation with Nuno, he was kind of talking about kind of this, this tension between um, wanting to do um, more inner work and um, being still and doing sense making and then folks who want to go out and like you know do a lot of active action and 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 these more kind of focused direction to things that they do and how can you have both and how can they both exist and maybe some sometimes sometimes they'll cross over sometimes they won't um but yeah that's kind of what i was trying to go for with 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 the tracks in the same way that like the summit, in a sense, didn't have a whole lot of structure. It, all it did in terms of structure was say stage one, two, three, four, five. But then within that, you could you could put you everybody could kind of add their own things. Like the last two weeks was just like stuff that wasn't even there before that people were just adding in. And and so that that was kind of my thought with the tracks too. That like there's going to be people who all they want to do is connect, so they can then those people can join kind of that track and just put those things in. There's gonna be people who wanna do all three. They can kind of do things in all three. There's gonna be people who wanna do just like the, I, I wanna deal with the climate crisis out there and that I wanna work on that big world problem. They can do that too. So I feel like um, the cool thing about this is that anybody can step up and offer what they wanna offer and anybody can show up and receive what they wanna receive. Uh, you can put yourself in whatever role you want, whenever you want, if they can be a bit of a chameleon. So, yeah. Absolutely. If you don't wanna be a chameleon, you can do that too. You can you can stick to what. Well, and, and I, I think that, you know, where the, some of the highest possibilities lie is, is when there is cross-pollination among those tracks, right? Yeah. Um, which doesn't mean everybody has to be in all of them. It just means, you know, some people have to, or there's some processes that, that you know, create those interweavings. Um, but I think that is, that's part of your intention and in design and bring this forward. And, and the, how we do that more skillfully, that's, that's part of the, the, new, the new frontier. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, that's the big question, I think. And, and how can we use the real life spaces and the virtual spaces in a way that allows us to do that more skillfully? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know if Dita wanted to um, kind of see some clo closing, ask some closing questions or say some closing remarks. Um, yeah. I just would like to say hooray for Zoom crashing because now we have you also part of the interview, which is what I wanted. <laughs> there we go. We were, yeah. we were, I was trying to my worst you know. nightmare. I was like, oh no, now I have to like actually be Dita. And it was <laughs> so fantastic. I what I'm doing. You, don't, you don't have to be me, you have to be you and that's fantastic. So awkward. No. Uh, thankfully, Ben's just like natural and he just, uh, yeah. He, he 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 just kept going seamlessly as if nothing happened so well there's enough practice of that i think in in so many um zoom and and other platforms well, well i was trying to craft some meaning or some special story around what was happened. going on with that but yeah. you named it you nailed it is that it brought shanti into exactly. the visible space here <laughs> absolutely so actually now i have to confess there was no problem with zoom it was just <laughs> uh, so that shanti could come in this is what i meant i told i told you that dita has sinister mas machinations and she she denied it but i knew i knew all along <laughs> i never denied it i never denied it <laughs> <laughs> just want to really thank you both it's just it's such a pleasure to listen to to both of you and and to i don't know feel that whenever we do this something changes maybe only in me but maybe also outside in the world and that's kind of my hope at the moment so thank you so much for for everything for all your work and and showing up and talking to us well it was a pleasure and a privilege for me what a sweet invitation thank you so much 
I'm gonna have to go watch that movie now. Yes. 